Hello and welcome everyone to another Incarnate live stream. Hey, today we're going to be turning these four battle maps into dynamic encounters. If you want to follow along in this stream, you can totally clone and edit this map. You'll find that link in the chat. If you're watching on YouTube, you're going to find it in the video description. Hey, let's not waste any time and just jump right in, okay? So the first battle map that we have is a camp encounter. And no surprise, camp encounters are very common. Great way to start a campaign or you'll eventually have an encounter uh, with in a camp eventually somewhere in your campaign. Whether you bump into an enemy camp and you're trying to do a kind of not a siege, but you're trying to do a surprise attack on your enemies, or perhaps you're doing the camp and enemies are coming upon you to get you, or maybe they have some kind of goal or objective, okay? Now, with the first thing with battle maps, to make them more dynamic, is to really have things that the players can interact with. So an immersive encounter makes an encounter more dynamic. So already you can see that we kind of have some a fire right here, which is something that the players and enemies can interact with. So, and notice that I have the grid on, that's super important because the grid is not just helpful for mute movement, but for making it clear when an enemy or a player is on top of something that does environmental damage, or there's a puzzle that they have to step on exactly. So all of those things, okay? All right, let's go ahead and get started. So the fire right there, players can be push enemies into a fire or they can pick up a stick and catch it on fire and maybe use it for some kind of damage, right? So the an immersive environment, super important. Maybe you have an enemy that falls back on top of one of the bedrolls. Players can move that bedroll and like they're doing a, a rug and just pull up from underneath an enemy's foot and they'll fall over. Okay, so really what's on the map is going to have a lot of influence on what the players can and can't do on top of what your enemies can do. Now, if you have uh, any suggestions or you're a DM and you want to share your thoughts on how you do dynamic encounters, feel free to share that in the chat, by the way. I mean, I'm always willing to see what other people have to say and the people in the chat might also want to hear it because I'm not going to be able to cover every single thing that you can do with a dynamic encounter, okay? So again, have that grid on so that that way you can line things up so that it's very clear when a player or an enemy is on a square that has environmental damage or whatever. That's super important, okay? Let's go ahead and start with uh, the terrain. For me, terrain is going to mean everything. It's going to decide your monsters, what their action economy is. If you're not familiar with action economy, action economy is what the range of actions that a player or a monster can have. Traditionally, players have a broader action economy simply because you know, you don't want your enemies to have such a robust action economy that they completely destroy your players. When it comes to an encounter, you want it to be difficult enough that it's a challenge for your players and it's not boring, but at the same time, not so challenging that it puts off your players. Believe me, that happens, okay? So just keep that in mind. Let's start with the first thing that I would recommend is having some kind of terrain. So let's throw in some cliffs. This is one of the most simplest things that you can do for any map is to throw in some cliffs. When you have cliffs, what you have now is that players or enemies have some elevation and they have to work around it. So for instance, if you have an enemy right here, let's say you wanna kick them off the cliff and they fall down, there's some damage right there. Or let's say that you want an enemy or you has to climb up and that makes them vulnerable, right? Because sometimes they might wanna travel quickly up instead of going around into the camp, okay? So cliffs are an absolute great way. Having some kind of vertical thing really, really helps so that that way you can use environmental damage, use the environment to your advantage, or even the enemies can use the environment to their advantage. Now, when it comes to choosing what kind of monsters you're going to have, the terrain means a lot. Okay, their action economy is going to be determined by the terrain. Is there a lot of trees? Would an enemy with a bow and arrow or a slingshot or an arbalist, would that be useful to you in a 
wooded area, or is the area open to where ranged weapons and ranged attacks are more useful? So if you're confused on what kind of action economy to give your monsters, it's not hard. Use the terrain to decide what the action economy of a monster or an enemy will be, okay? Because your environment means so freaking much. I can't even tell you how important a immersive environment is in an encounter okay now when it also comes to goals of a battle the environment also plays a huge role so the environment is super important let's keep going with environment <clears throat> some other things you might want to consider is more environmental elements to create a challenge for instance you can throw in a thorn bush that means that if an enemy or you your player gets caught in a thorn bush maybe they're caught and they can't move around as much like they're caught then that gives you the player or the enemy an advantage to do an attack so really the environment plays a huge role okay you can also count it as environmental damage maybe you do a combat kick that kicks an enemy or yourself or player into the thorn bush doing environmental damage so thorn bush is super important right let's go with um more environmental stuff let's go with tall grass tall grass is super helpful not also does it affect your the players and the enemy's field of vision but it's also something you can use to hide so for instance let's say that it was an ambush you are being ambushed your players or the en or you're ambushing some monsters on the road that maybe kidnap somebody that you're trying to protect, or maybe they stole something from you and you're finally catching up to them at their little camp. You have these nice tall grass right here, which is great. You can hide behind here for an ambush. You can also hide down here for an ambush. So really the environment's also gonna play a huge role in that next step, which is positioning. Where is it that you position your monsters at the beginning of the battle and where your players are going to be positioned? So it's super important that you think about the environment when it comes to positioning. And positioning is going to be super important because it could affect environmental damage. It could affect successful uh, sneak, sneak or stealth missions or encounters. It can also affect whether or not uh, certain players can use certain spells and things like that. So positioning, super important. So just kind of keep that in mind, okay? So that's kind of the simplest one. And now that you kind of know what we're going to be working on, we can go over to the next one, a cave, okay? So let's move over to a cave encounter. Your, every campaign generally has some kind of cave encounter, and they're pretty easy to put together. You just use your cliff walls and then make the outside bl pure black because that's a mountain. You're not going to see that. Now, how is it that you would make a dynamic encounter in a cave? Well, just like we did with the camp, you want to add the cliffs, right? So throw in some terrain. Boom. Already the map has changed quite a bit. We've got some elevation and I've even included a large rock for a player to climb up on a ladder. You'll see there's a ladder here. That's called access. It's super important that when you have tall places or a pit or some place that gives some kind of environmental advantage for a player or for a monster, they need access to get to that place. And notice carefully that the ladder is on specifically a square space. So when a player goes up on that ladder, they're on that square space. That means that if there's someone on top of that rock, they can kick the ladder down and they can fall down for some environmental damage. So whether it's your players or whatever, so you kick this ladder down and they fall down, doing some damage when they fall down, or if there's a player down there, they can do the attack while they've fallen down. So think about placement, think about access. Those things are gonna be super important. Okay, so just terrain alone immediately adds in some little bit more dynamic to the battle. Let's keep adding in some more things here. Now, I see some people have mentioned, you know, like, oh, should I have a trap be visible on a map or not? Okay, now a trap can serve several purposes. It can be invisible and unknown to your players or even to the enemies and that's fine then you get surprised when you fall in the trap or get trapped okay but showing the trap making it visible also allows players to set up a strategy to use the trap to their advantage 
So don't, not every trap has to be invisible on your encounter map. Having it visible again means that your players can set up a strategy. For instance, if you, uh, Let's say there was a monster or some creature next to the pit standing watch. You could jump off of this ledge right here, kick, and then they fall into the trap. And that eliminates one enemy from the battle immediately because they've fallen in the trap. They've been impaled. They're dead. This works great if there's um, more enemies on the battle than your players can actually handle. But just remember that if you are going to have the players be overwhelmed, horde style, by little minions, make sure that those monsters, those creatures, are very low levels. So that way it's not too difficult. It's easy to overpower players with a lot of monsters on the field of battle, but if you have them at lower levels, that makes them easier to deal with. Now, if you are going to add multiple enemies, and a lot of them, that are low level minions, make sure to throw in at least one mid level, maybe a boss or someone that's a little bit more powerful, has a stronger action economy. So that way there's some challenge to it. You don't want it to be so easy where they just destroy three minions in just a couple rounds, a couple moves. Make sure there's a challenge. So throw in maybe a couple mid level monsters so that it's a little bit easier or not easier, but throws a challenge for your players. Okay. So again, I just want to mention, it's okay to have the traps be visible because you never know if a player, if players might devise a strategy to remove enemies from the field by using the traps. Now, when it comes to goals, sometimes it's nice to throw in some items like a chest, okay? A chest is a very clear goal. You're trying to get to that chest. Maybe there's a key inside of it. It's important to pushing along into the main campaign. Maybe there's a special item in the chest that the players need to progress further into the main campaign. It's entirely up to you, okay? I'm gonna keep throwing in some more stuff. More stuff, more environmental stuff is really helpful. Since you're in a cave, it makes sense there'd be some debris, some rubble. And it's great to have debris and rubble because you could use the debris and rubble as a weapon to smash someone's head in with a rock. Let's say that it's dark and you can't see and neither can your enemies. You can use the rock to as a kind of a, a distraction. You throw a rock in a certain area, a monster might move to where the sound came from, moving them away from an area that you wish to take over. So it's super helpful, okay? We absolutely are live, Satoru Lad. Just ask the questions in the chat. We don't have a, um, a moderator, so hopefully if there's any chatters in there who'll be able to help you. This is totally live. I'm not, uh, this is not pre recorded, but it will be recorded and added to YouTube. Okay, so just ask that question in the chat. If I can't get to you, that's fine. Just ask another user to help you out, okay? All right, so let's keep going. There are a couple more things that I want to add in this. Uh, what's really fun, more environmental damage and throwing in some tar, some oil. And that way, if a monster lands on that mark, guess what? You can take a, a torch, throw it on those tiles, and it will do damage to a monster, okay? Notice that there's a, right here is a torch. And if you don't have a torch, that's great. Then you can climb up this ladder, grab this torch. Maybe you can use a flint, catch the torch on fire, and throw it at one of these oil spills or tar pits right here. Great way to create environmental damage. Maybe you throw a rock at one of these pits, the, the enemy lands on it, then you throw the torch. So giving a strategy. Remember, players like options, okay? Never have a perfectly linear battle where there's only one way to win. You want to have multiple ways to defeat enemies and to reach the goal. Generally, when it comes to encounters, I have three types of outcomes. The, the success, which comes with a reward. The... Uh, you succeeded, but maybe a quintessent, but you barely succeeded. You still won, but maybe you lost a player. So you get a reward and a consequence or just straight up losing a battle. And there's a consequence for losing it. Whatever you do, do not make the battle linear where there's only one way to win the battle. If you do this, players will get bored. Players like choices. They like it when they can say, okay, there are multiple ways that I could approach this, this battle. 
So make sure that you give players options. No one wants to feel like they're boxed into one strategy to win because what you want to do is play off of your players' strengths and weaknesses. So multiple options, multiple ways to win allows for that to happen, okay? All right, I'm going to throw in one more thing that I want to throw in, and that is creating pressure, pressure plates or puzzles. Those things are super important. So let's just say that when you enter this battle, um, when your players go in, a gate comes down and closes it. But the only way to open that gate is by having all of your players stand on these pressure plates, and that will cause it to open. Maybe there's a specific order in which the players have to land on those plates to open it. Or maybe there is a puzzle Maybe it applies to a puzzle that will unlock the chest. So throwing in more than just pure battle, hack and slash until you win, throwing in puzzles, throwing in an environment that creates a little exploration as well as puzzles can make an encounter more dynamic. Don't just limit it to just beating the crap out of your enemies until you win because that is that's great for some battles, but it's not great for every battle because you don't want your players to get board. So be sure that you throw in puzzle elements, whether it's you have to solve some kind of puzzle, you pick up an item and put it inside of a slot, or if you have to uh, maybe throw down a puzzle that's got a piano and you have to pay, play certain keys to open up a door, be creative, okay? Now that's it for the cave. There's a couple more encounters left. Let's go to the next two. The next one is going to be some ruins in a forest area, okay? Love ruined battles. They're fun. I love them. They're great. I want you to notice again that I've got the grid on and notice that these five feet, five feet thick walls allows for players to move on top of these walls or on top of the pillars. So that's super nice and they're lined up with the grid. So that's perfect. Let's move over to ruins. So with the ruins, let's add in the access point. How do players and enemies get to the top of these walls, right? Well, you can throw in vines. Vines are fabulous. They work great. A player can climb up the vine to get up top. So notice there's a vine right here. A player can get on top of that and then jump over to this next vine right here. And now they can scale these top parts of the walls, giving them a height advantage, whether it's a ranged weapon or coming down to strike for some extra damage. Again, the X layer, that meaning that the higher up vertical allows for much more dynamic encounters. A flat map limits players' movements to just a flat space. Vertical or adding in some height allows for way more opportunities for your both your players and for your enemies, okay? So let's also throw in some other things like some rocks. Remember earlier in the caves we had rocks? These work great. Rocks are can be used as a weapon. They can be used to be thrown at something, to move a, a guard away for an, from an area so that you can capture that area for your players. So rocks, super important. I'm also going to throw in a staircase, a ruined staircase. This is great. Now you have a way to back. You have, let's say that you have a monster right here. Okay. And you're going in through the main entrance. All right. Then, then this, there's an ambush, a ranged weapon can go to an attack. I definitely recommend that you have multiple entry points, especially for a ruin, because it's fallen apart, right? Let's go look at the entry points and then look at the date, the pros and cons of each entry point. The main entrance leads you at a great disadvantage because there's a spot for enemies to be right here, right? That doesn't work. So let's not, maybe the entrance isn't the best way. You could try going in this way through this bush but going through that bush might rustle leaves and make enemies aware of your presence. You could also go in this way. It still comes with pros and cons. If it's nighttime, there's a light here, your players could be exposed, right? So think about points of entry 
and think about a strategy that your players want to come together and figure out how they are going to infiltrate this ruin without being seen. Or maybe they just want to go straight on Conan the Barbarian and just go head in first. Okay, it's really up to you and how you set up the environment and how players and what their playing style is. Nothing wrong with a little Conan the Barbarian kicking monster butt. That's okay. All right, but stealth and having a strategy is always going to give you, the players, an advantage when you think out your plan first before diving in head first. Really, it's it's up to you as the DM how you want to set up the battle and to play off the weaknesses and the strengths of every player. Okay, you don't ever want to leave a single player out during a battle, while at the same time you do want to at least give every player a sense of accomplishment in every battle. It doesn't have to be every single player, but throughout each encounter, you want to make sure that each player allows for their action economy to, sh to shine and to make them feel like they're a quintessential part because it's really easy for players to lose interest in a game. So having dynamic encounters keeps players engaged, makes them want to continue playing the game, and it also just allows for grand strategy, really making it easier uh, and making it more fun, okay? Now, I want to add in a couple more things. Notice here there's this vine right here. If sometimes you might have like a living vine, right? And the vine will grab an enemy and then pull them in and maybe attack them. So it's one way to make it clear that this is a uh, some kind of living creature is to throw a pool of blood in right there. So that way... People notice like, oh, hey, there's something about that vine. So be sure to make sure that when you are trying to sh convey to players that, hey, this area does something specific, make sure that you give them hints, inklings. You don't have to give it away verbally and say, oh, there's a pool of blood there. You could possibly do this. You as a DM don't have to tell your players, you have to show your players. So throwing in a pool of blood by a vine will send a hint that, hey, those just aren't any old vines. Those are living grasping vines that if someone steps on those vine tiles, they'll get grasped, choked to death, killed, eaten by a man-eating fly, whatever, <laughs> and flying trap, whatever it is, right? So remember, show the players the strategies, the, the things that they can do, don't tell them. You don't want to do that, okay? All right, let's go on to the last encounter, the mo the largest encounter, and one that I find most fascinating. I love roof battles, and I noticed on um, I noticed on Discord that some people were also mentioning how do I put together a roof battle? Perfect. So let's put that together. First of all, you're going to notice that I'm using what are called mansard roofs. Mansard roofs have a flat roof on top. Okay, and notice that I've lined them up perfectly with the grid. So if you look carefully, players know exactly where to move onto a flat surface. Every single roof has these flat surfaces so that that way it's very clear how to access and where to go and to do movements, okay? Let's first talk about, <clears throat> let's talk about entryways or access. The first one is you have main access going in here this way. This is a dangerous way to move in because you can have people here and here that might want to do an ambush when you come into the town square area. There's also another main entryway here that will take you onto the main square area. Okay, so two points of access. And there's a third point of access that actually leads you to an area that's not in the main access area. It's just a little higher up. Perhaps this entryway is the best entranceway and we can throw in some things that might block enemies view allowing for an easier point of entry again have multiple ways to enter an area because this way it's going to give your players choice you don't want to limit their possibilities players like choices not a thousand choices because that's confusing but three or four choices allows for players to figure out their strategy and to figure out what their pros and cons of each character's action economy and what's going to be useful for them okay so you now you know the access points into this main area let's go ahead and add in access points to the roof so i'm going to throw in access 
to the roof part. You're going to notice here that I've got a ladder. It's directly on a space, so you know exactly where the ladder is. And again, if there's somebody up there, you can push the ladder, the person can fall off. Notice here too that there is some wooden planks here that lead across onto the next one, or players can do a massive jump, 10 foot jump really, onto the next roof. Okay, so roof battles, you gotta have access. How are they gonna get to the roof? How are they gonna get from other roofs from one house? All those are important. Okay, let's talk about more about access. Let me throw in some vines. Just like earlier, we had vines in that ruins. Vines are great for climbing up. It does put you at a, at a disadvantage, but having, yes, acrobatics, D12 acrobatics to cross those planks, they do look a little thin now, don't they? Okay, but let's have some vines here. Players can climb up to the larger roof here, and then they can secure the upper level. If you have a ranged player who is not very good in melee combat, perhaps you can take that, you can guide a player a ranged character up the vines, up onto the roof, now giving them a height advantage, whether it's a spell, whether it's a ranged weapon, whatever it might be. Maybe there's some combatants on the roof and you want to kick them off for some damage when they fall off onto the ground, right? So think about those things. So access, super important. Let's talk about obstructions that is hiding the field of view, okay? Let me throw in some vegetation. Earlier, we talked about this point right here being an excellent access point. It's perfect unless there's obviously an enemy here, but you can climb up here, go into here, and you'll notice that you have these bushes that are obstructing the view. So there's an access point that's going to be useful. Now, if you wanted to, you can throw in an enemy up here so that that way it's not going to be as easy as just going up and then you have the high ground advantage. Make your players work for the high point advantage. Perhaps a player is facing this or an enemy is facing this way and they're focusing on this entrance way. Then you can come in, sneak up behind them and then combat kick them off the roof or maybe kill them silently on the roof so that they, their fall doesn't make other enemies aware of your presence. Okay, so be careful. Think about the environment. Notice also that there are chimneys. Chimneys are also a great way for you to hide so that that way, let's say you have someone right here or someone right here, enemies that are in these spaces, they're not going to be able to see you because there's a fireplace. Oopsie, my bad. There's a chimney in the way, right? So take advantage of things on the roof Okay, take advantage of those things. So make sure that you have something on the roof that will obstruct the view of enemies so that you can. So make sure that you mention the player, the enemy's field of view, which way they're facing, because so that way you can stealthily move across to the next point right here without being seen by enemies on the ground or other roof, or if they're on the roof. Okay, so think these are important to the strategy. Okay, let's go ahead and continue with our roof combat. I'm just going to delete all these paths right here. We don't need them. Let's go ahead and throw in some more stuff. Let's continue with combat on the ground. Crates and barrels. I cannot tell you how important crates and barrels are. They're not just great for filling in negative space on your map, but they can be used as weapons. They can be used to hide behind them. You can pick them up and smash someone's head in with it. Okay, lots of things you can do with it. Um, for instance, you can use a barrel for combat. Let's say that you have an enemy right here. Okay, and let's say that you want to sneak up behind them, kick the barrel, and then the barrel will roll and they'll fall off right here. Okay, so super important. Think about how crates and barrels could be useful for you when you're trying to Think about how can I use crates and barrels? They're not just for aesthetics. They're not just there to fill in negative space. They can be absolutely quintessential elements to getting the quick or the sneak on enemies, okay? 
that because stealth is super important, okay, in your combat. It's going to show how much discipline your players have. It's going to put them under a tent situation to see how they work together. You want to encourage your players to work together to find a strategy to defeat enemies. So make sure that crates and barrels are in certain areas that were or strategic locations that you can use to take advantage of sneaking up on enemies. Super important. Let's keep going. There's a whole bunch more that we can add. I wanted to throw in some stuff on the roof so that that way you could use that to your advantage. So for instance, you've got some shingles right here. These shingles are great. They can be used to be thrown at an enemy. You can throw them somewhere to distract an enemy, just like the rocks in the previous encounter maps. Think of them as the same concept. Weapons, a distraction, whatever it is you want to do with them. Okay, useful. Um, notice that these shingles come from these dark spots right here. Maybe you want to kick an enemy onto that space and the roof will collapse and they'll die going down. Okay, so think about those things. The environment is absolutely useful. Okay, I'm also going to throw in some tools and stuff. Let's throw in a hammer. I'm going to put a hammer up here. This could be useful. Maybe you want to use the hammer to break off some tiles. Just know that that's going to create a sound and make your player, make the enemies uh, aware of your position. Just think about all these things when you're putting things together, okay? And let's talk a little bit about action economy real quick for your enemies. Just like I said earlier in the stream, generally your players are going to have a broader action economy than your enemies. Again, the reason why is because you don't want your players to lose the battle. You want them to win by giving a broader action economy to your enemies. You kind of give them the advantage. So it's always good to give the players a little bit more of the advantage and have more options than your enemies because you don't want the battle to be impossible. You want it to be challenging, but not where you're most certainly going to get defeated. So always think that in mind. You want to make it a challenge and difficult without making it impossible. Players get frustrated very easily when they find that the battle is very quickly turning against them. And that can be a lot of pressure. It can be difficult. So make sure that there is the slight advantage towards your players without making it super easy or making it way too difficult. So think about that. Now, when it comes to action economy with players, I always like to throw in one play, one enemy that kind of has an advantage and is a total hindrance to my players. And for this one, I would put them on the roof with a ranged weapon so that that way they're a total hindrance and you won't be able to get very far in the battle without taking them out first. So throw in an enemy combatant that has something in their action economy that gives them an advantage where they are on the battle and that way your players can focus on, okay, I need to find out a strategy to defeat this monster first before moving on to the goal sets. Okay, so one enemy that has one advantage over the players can be helpful so that that way you can devise a strategy. Instead of just moving straight into the battle and just becoming cannon fodder for the person on top, make sure you have your players set up a strategy that has them sneak up to the top, take out an enemy here, get across here, and maybe hit them with a ranged weapon right there. Now, there are multiple ways, but that's just the way that's going to make the battle easier for your players. Again, players like choices. They do not like it when they only have one way to win the battle. If you have it to where there's an all-powerful enemy at the top, no matter what players do, they're always going to die or take serious damage trying to get to them. Don't do that. Make sure that whoever that one advantaged monster is, is that there is a way to get to them, access, and there's a way to take them down with somewhat ease, okay? So it's always important to think about the action economy of your enemies and how their action economy is going to provide a, uh, a strategy for your players to devise, okay? Let's talk a little bit about positioning since we already have positioning here. So you have maybe one ranged weapon enemy here, you have one enemy here, and they're there because if you players decide to go this route, there'll be an ambush. We'll put another one here. And of course, if your players go this way, 
they have a sneak advantage because they can't see them with that bush. If you go this route, we do have this barrel right here. That's an advantage. Okay, so each route, each entrance way is going to come with different strategies to take out your enemies. I don't normally recommend having a lot of monsters on the field for an encounter like this because if you've already got a player with an advantage, or not a player, but an enemy with a ranged advantage, you don't need to put a lot of monsters on the ground or enemies on the ground. You only need to put a couple because, again, what gives the challenge of this map is not how many monsters are on the field, but what their action economy, the challenge that the action economy has for your players. Okay, so just remember that the challenge is determined by the environment. Okay, maybe if you have a flat region where there's just a couple cliffs and it's a larger battle, that's fine. Make sure there's a lot of maneuverability because there's a lot of enemies on the field. But with something like this, it's the environment that gives the advantage to the, each one of the monsters and their action economy. So just factor that in, okay? All right, well, we're 35 minutes. Um, I don't want to take any bit longer. I hope that this was helpful. I'm going to do one quick one quick review just to remind you. Uh, remember that an immersive environment is, is absolutely quintessential to a dynamic encounter. That means whether it's thorn bushes, whether it's tall grass, whether it's a cliff, whether it's a slick oil that you can catch on fire, or an explosive barrel that if you hit with a fire arrow will blow up the enemies around you, whether it's a trap that's invisible or visible, whether it's the height that gives either your players or your enemies some sort of advantage, whether it's access like vines or an environmental piece that creates environmental damage like fire or grasping vines or a trap, whatever it might be, okay? Your players like options. They do not like it when you give them one way to win the battle with just one goal, with one outcome. So think about when you're planning your encounters, what is the goal? Decide the goal by the encounter, the environment, your player, your enemies, action economy, what kind of enemies and their action economy are going to be determined by the environment, the traps and where everything's going to be placed, the position of units, all of this is decided by your environment. So when you're putting together a battle map, always think about the environmental damage, the things that are going to be in the environment. Once the environment is established, then you can decide your enemies and then decide their action economy depending by the environment and of course the goals right it's always important to think about the multiple goals whether they want to with the campfire maybe there's again i mentioned they stole something from you and you're trying to do an ambush to get that item back or if you are part of the camp then maybe there's enemies trying to kidnap someone you're defending if that person gets kidnapped, then you've lost the battle. It comes with a consequence, but the battle's not completely lost. You can go chase after them. So it's always super important to absolutely think about your environment. It's going to really going to decide almost everything else about the combat, the action economy, the monsters, the positioning, all of that stuff. Okay. All right. Well, hey, Thank you so much, everyone. Really glad that you were here. If you're still looking for this map, you can totally, absolutely find it on my profile, clone and edit it. Uh, if you want to use an individual one, you can do the resize feature. Just want to show you, you can use a resize map and then just resize one of the individual pieces like this. Okay, and then just press confirm. So really you can make one battle map by just using the resize feature because if there's one of these encounter maps that you like more than the other, that's fine. Just resize it, and that way you can use these encounters. I only have one quick announcement. Next month, we're going back to 3 p.m. PST. Summer's over. No need to continue with the 9 a.m. PST. So I hope that you will find a way to acclimate back to 3 p.m. PST. I really hope that you found all of this useful. And I'm really glad that people asked questions and did things in the chat because there's so much to dynamic encounters. It's not just what I said. There are so many options. Feel free to join our Discord server. Our mentors are incredibly helpful. Go there. 
I'm Mati. Go ahead and ping me if you need any advice about your encounter map. I'm always willing to help. Hey, I love you guys. Hope you had a great summer. Looking forward to seeing you all again in the next stream. So please stay safe and healthy and merry map making, everybody. Take it easy, okay? Bye, everyone.